Throughout the years, Google has invested a lot of dedication into their applications, making them highly successful among millions, if not billions, of people around the world. Google Earth was no exception, being a go-to software for almost everyone when it came to finding and manipulating geospatial data. Surely one can say Google is unrivaled in competition, backed by a collection of achievements no one else could have possibly done before. Google Earth in the present represents a success story. Google Earth in the future is anything but a mystery. Yet there has always been one confusing piece of the puzzle. What was Google Earth like in the past? How did Google Earth come to fruition? What was going on before Keyhole was released? And was there any inspiration taken from other people at the time? To find a real starting point, you would have to travel across the world to Berlin, Germany. The year is 1993, a long while before Google Earth was even conceptualized. A team of computer programmers, hackers, and artists, the most prominent of them being Hua Chim Saucher, formed a company called Artcom, using technology and graphic design as a new form of artistic media. They used Onyx computers, produced by Silicon Graphics, to render and display artistic demonstrations at the highest quality. One of these was a freely rotating model of the Earth. Nothing else, just freely rotating. It cannot be interacted upon in any way. Salcher's team suddenly realized they could create an application that would allow for such a thing to happen to let users fly across the globe and zoom in on a specific location, to finally add the element of interaction to art with technology. They named their project T-Vision or TeraVision. That's right, Keyhole was not the first to come up and carry out the idea of virtual globe exploration. As a matter of fact, T-Vision was successfully able to implement a smooth linkage of imagery levels ranging from metadata imagery of the globe to high-resolution satellite imagery covering a small area. They also figured out a way to store imagery in a decentralized network, which can be loaded if necessary by the operating systems using the application. By 1994, Artcom filed a patent for their algorithm, titling it the method and device for pictorial representation of space-related data. TeraVision was now in the clear to start gaining a following across people all over the world. 1995 was Artcom's big break. Not only did the team get endorsement from Juice Post AG to implement a high-speed visitor-based network in the application, but they gained an outstanding reputation among people from different nations. TeraVision stole the show at the 1995 International Telecommunication Union Conference in Kyoto, Japan, displaying the globe using Reality Engine twin monitors and a trackball spinning interface with dial to zoom in and out. It was remarkable, especially considering how this proved TeraVision could work in any software configuration. Salcher's team went on to garner more acclaim at the Interactive Media Festival in Los Angeles, California, where they won the judges' competition and monetary prize. Unfortunately, this is where half of the story ends. Little was heard from Artcom about further developing their stellar Virtual Earth program for use by everyone. Yet while Terra Vision was backing from the spotlight, Google was stepping forward to take it. Two future executives of Google, Michael Jones and Brian McClendon, were also working for Silicon Graphics during the 90s, the company that created the Onyx engine for TeraVision to work. Both executives were aware of Salcher's project and were alleged to have private information about their application. Michael Jones, in particular, worked directly with Artcom as a designated contact person. A little while after TeraVision was out of the public eye, however, Jones and McClendon 
were employed by Intrinsic Graphics, eventually creating their own virtual exploration program, Keyhole, with John Hankey overseeing the creation. It has been highly suggested that the team at Keyhole took direct inspiration from Artcom to create their application, especially since one of the executives had collaborated directly with the German team. Things were about to turn uglier, however. By 2005, Google ended up buying Keyhole and rebranding their software Google Earth. They even hired the managers at Keyhole to become executives for Google's Geo Group. In early 2006, Artcom stepped forward to try and protect their intellectual property. The director of technology for Artcom, Pavel Meyer, sent an email to Google regarding their patent on manipulating geodata and imagery. Google even planned to meet the team in Berlin, eager to carry on discussions on patent licensing, company acquisition, and stakeholding. Eventually, Google scrapped the collaboration aspect of the agreement, only allowing Artcom to sell Televisión as a nice-to-have patent. In response, Artcom refused the restricted business agreement. Yet Google, in spite of risking patent infringement, did nothing to resolve the situation. Then came February of 2014, the month that Artcom took decisive action in a $100 million lawsuit against Google for patent infringement. An intense trial followed for two years. Sadly, in 2016, the jury ruled in favor of Google, and in 2017, Artcom failed to appeal the ruling. What was humorously ironic regarding the deciding factor of evidence for the trial was that Google through Keyhole had direct collaborations with a project also called TerraVision. This time, however, it was overseen by the Stanford Research Institute's Magic Project in 1991, which experimented with zooming in on a 3D representation of a Californian military base to a very accurate resolution of a meter. One of Google's programmers, Stephen Q. Lau, backed this further, testifying that he demonstrated this program, called SRI TerraVision, to the public as early as 1994. Here we are in the present day, a time when we have just scratched the surface to find the real answer to who had the original idea of Google Earth. There were many more minor contenders for virtual Earth exploration, including Skyline Software Systems Inc. that filed a lawsuit against Google in 2004, and Topware's DSAT CDs that used Russian satellite imagery at a low resolution, but were able to sell to the public by 1996. What we can learn from this is that no one can claim a stake at being the first to invent an idea. What matters is who can be the best at demonstrating and distributing that idea to the world. As of Artcom, I am glad to hear they are doing well, commissioning media sculptures and virtual interaction exhibits that go beyond expectation in architecture, function, and symbolism. Their astounding works of art can be viewed in galleries all over Europe and Asia. In recent newfound success, we have learned the sad news that Joachim Salcher, the head of design for Artcom, passed away. Nevertheless, Televisión has gained newfound popularity in the Netflix series The Billion Dollar Code, which I strongly recommend you watch. Overall, the tale of the prequel to Google Earth has shown us all but the grim truth that data is the weapon of the future, and if people don't fight to protect it, in the future, all of their data will be in the wrong hands.